Hello, and welcome everybody to this uh, virtual talk for the Living Latin Online uh, program. Um, I was saying, uh, or at least I thought I was saying, uh, uh, normally doing one of these talks, we would be in Rome uh, in a beautiful uh, amphitheater uh, in a um, uh, monastery in the Prati neighborhood, and it has a beautiful frescoed ceiling and uh, Latin words outlining the virtues uh, of uh, mansuetudo et probitas uh, and things like this. Um, so, um, uh, but uh, doing it on Zoom does have some benefits. So we get to welcome people from all over the country and the world and um, include lots of uh, Paideia staff members from different programs. So I'm happy about that. Uh, okay. Um, I am very happy also to introduce our speaker, Marco Romani. Uh, Marco is the Director of European Operations for Paideia. He is based in Rome and he runs the Rome office. Um, Marco is an uh, important uh, person for this program in particular because he has a, a background in ancient science. So uh, when the pandemic struck and we were wondering what to do with our summer programs, um, Marco had the idea of uh, doing a course on ancient pandemics and we, uh, that was for Telepidea. We saw it was very popular and we, we said, you know what, why don't we change the subject of our uh, intensive summer programs as well um, and, uh, and make it about that. And, and they enrolled very well. And so that's great. So uh, Marco is going to be giving us uh, our talk for this Living Latin program and we're excited to hear from him and we should be because uh, Marco has a PhD in classics from Harvard University, uh, which he finished right before joining uh, Paideia a few years ago. And while he was at Harvard, he taught and researched on um, Greek and Roman uh, science and antiquity, in addition to Greek and Latin literature. So he, his research focuses on the role of science as uh, ancient intellectual history, and he's published uh, numerous articles in scholarly journals on ancient science, um, including uh, Enthumima, uh, Classical Quarterly, and the International Journal of the Classical Tradition. So um, we're very lucky to have uh, a resident expert on ancient science, medicine, and sickness and wellness here at Paideia. And uh, I look forward to hearing what he has to say. So thank you, Marco. Take it away. Great, thank you so much, Jason. Uh, and thanks to everybody for being here. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, be talking about medicine in uh, Greco-Roman antiquity today. So uh, let's get started. Um, I'll, I'll give a quick uh, overview of what's happening uh, in the next few minutes and, and then we'll dive straight into it. Uh, so we're going to be talking about ancient uh, Greek and Roman medicine uh, specifically. So when I when I say antiquity, I, I typically mean uh, Greek and Roman antiquity as, you know, for the purposes of our uh, summer programs, that, that's quite uh, predictable. Uh, first of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give an overview of um, the sources, how uh, we know what we know about ancient medicine. Uh, and then I'm going to give, uh, I'm going to give you guys a, a sense of um, uh, the most kind of widespread uh, medical theories and practices uh, in Greek and Roman antiquity. Of course, you know, we, uh, we only have the time to sort of barely uh, scratch the surface here, um, but we'll do our best. Okay, so uh, first of all, um, I, like to, uh, I like to start with uh, what I call ancient medicine today. Um, I think that Ancient medicine is far more present, far more tangible in the modern world around us uh, than is commonly assumed. Uh, what, we, what you see here on this slide is a, uh, is a Latin inscription on the facade of the New York uh, Academy of Medicine, which, uh, which is a 20th century building. It has a lot of uh, interesting Latin on it, uh, most of which uh, comes from uh, either medical or uh, non-medical literature, but still has to do with uh, the idea of healing. You can see the, the Virgil quote here. Um, 
I also like to, uh, I, I'd like to start with, you know, a, a frequently uh, overlooked uh, presence of uh, ancient medicine today. Uh, the, uh, the logo, the symbol you have on the, on the bottom left corner of the, of the slide is the logo of the World Health Organization, uh, which, is, uh, which has, has been making the headlines almost every day, especially during the early stages of the COVID pandemic. And um, uh, not many people today realize that uh, part of the logo of the World Health Organization is actually uh, Asclepius's rod, right? The, uh, the staff of Asclepius, you can, see a, um, you can see a marble statue from antiquity here on the right side. Uh, the staff with a snake that is a, kind of the typical symbol of Asclepius, the ancient god of medicine, is still, uh, is still used today in a number of places, uh, you know, the American Medical Association, for example, and uh, the World Health Organization and so on, uh, to kind of symbolize um, healing in general. So it, it's, kind of, it's, it's kind of interesting to me at least that um, modern uh, institutions devoted to medicine and healing uh, choose this kind of ancient Greco-Roman uh, symbolism to, to refer to what they do. Okay, um, let's dive straight into the sources. Um, what, how do we know what we know uh, about ancient medicine, about healing in the ancient world? Uh, well, first of all, there are very tangible traces of uh, ancient healing sites. Uh, we know a lot, we know quite a lot about the places where, or some of the places where the healing actually happened. Uh, and some of these places are called uh, Asclepieia. Uh, we've, already, uh, we've already met Asclepius himself, the god of medicine, and Asclepieia are, of course, the sanctuaries uh, devoted to uh, this god. Um, they're pretty widespread throughout the, the ancient Mediterranean space. This one, for example, is on the, uh, on the Greek island of Kos, uh, just about uh, 3rd century uh, BCE, so built in the, in, in the early Hellenistic age. Uh, the Asclepiae are very interesting places because uh, we know that, uh, we now know that there was um, a lot of kind of interplay between uh, medical practices and religious uh, sort of outlooks on life, uh, on health and disease in these places. Uh, so, for example, uh, a common practice that was um, that was widespread in the in the Asclepieia uh, was what we know in in Latin as the incubatio. Um, so, the patient would be uh, put to sleep, uh, either just naturally or with the help of some, some sleep-inducing drugs. Um, and the idea is that the patient gets um, a dream. Uh, typically, uh, the god Asclepius himself appears to them in a dream and uh, either uh, heals them instantly, almost miraculously, or at least gives them instructions on what to do uh, to, to, be, to be healed and become uh, healthy again. Uh, so these, these Asclepiae are interesting places and we'll, we'll keep uh, talking about them and, and coming back to them in the, in the rest of the presentation. Um, another way in which uh, archeology span helps us understand uh, a bit more about ancient medicine um, is uh, the fact that we actually have instruments, we, we have tools that ancient physicians used in, uh, um, in, in Greece and Rome um, that have been found in places like Pompeii, for example, right? These are uh, surgical tools. Uh, you can see some, uh, some scissors, some forceps, uh, some uh, pliers and so on and so forth. Surgical tools, uh, typically metal tools, of course, um, uh, that have been found at sites like Pompeii help us uh, understand quite a lot about uh, external medicine and particularly surgical, of course, practices uh, in, in the ancient world. Uh, then we have, uh, oh, sorry, um, back one slide. Then we have artworks, of course. Uh, we have artworks that deal with uh, the idea of healing, the, the history of healing, and the mythology of healing in antiquity. So this, this mosaic, for example, from Kos, uh, 
uh, shows uh, Hippocrates as this guy here on the on the left with a with a white uh, kind of tunic. Um, Hippocrates is uh, ob either observing or, according to some people, dreaming about uh, the arrival of Asclepius, the god of medicine, on the island of Kos. You see Asclepius here disembarking from the from the boat uh, onto the island and being uh, greeted by a local uh, a local fisherman. So. Uh, what's happening here is that you see almost a genealogy of the art of medicine, right? The art of medicine is, is kind of being transmitted uh, directly from Asclepius, from the, from the divine world, from the, from the sphere of the gods, to Hippocrates, therefore to the human sphere. Hippocrates is, you know, uh, a common person, a mortal man like, like me and you. Um, so the, this, this direct transmission of knowledge from the divine sphere to the human world uh, is what characterizes a lot of um, the way in which the ancients and the ancient doctors in particular understood the beginnings of, of medicine itself. Another interesting um, trace or remnant of ancient medicine in the modern world, uh, besides what we've already talked about, is the so-called Hippocratic Oath. Um, if you have any, any friends or relatives who have been or are going or intend to go to med school, uh, you'll probably know that um, the Hippocratic Oath is still actually in use in, in most uh, med schools today, particularly in the US. Um, of course, what, what's in use today is a, is a modern version of the, of the Hippocratic Oath, but, it, but it's actually in many ways, in interesting ways, very similar to the ancient text. Uh, the Hippocratic Oath, uh, at least the ancient one, um, is a text that is generally thought to have very little to do with Hippocrates, uh, in the sense that uh, it was most likely produced uh, at some time in the late, uh, at some point in the late fourth century uh, BC, so quite uh, quite some time after uh, the main texts of the uh, of the Hippocratic Corpus. Um, but it's interesting because uh, uh, the doctor, the aspiring doctor that takes the oath. Uh, swears by uh, Apollo, Asclepius, and a number of other deities, and uh, pays, a, pays allegiance to um, the art of medicine and the ethics of, of medicine. So the, the, famous, uh, the famous idea of first do no harm, right? Primum non nocere in Latin, uh, which is still you know, very often quoted today, comes originally from uh, in a slightly different version comes from uh, the Hippocratic Oath, uh, which, is, which is still in use today. Um, so the doctor swears that uh, he or she will uh, try uh, their best to, uh, they, they will strive to uh, heal the patient, benefit the patient, or at least uh, do no harm to them. This is uh, you know, very important. Uh, early text, perhaps the first example of a, of a binding document. Uh, and interestingly enough, it, it's still used in, in many med schools today. Um, so besides the archaeological, the artistic evidence that we've already talked about, we also have quite a lot of textual uh, evidence, so a lot of uh, written sources. Uh, this is a, um, a page from a Latin manuscript uh, of the, uh, the Hippocratic Corpus. So the Hippocratic Corpus uh, is, a quite, is, is quite an interesting monster. Uh, it's, a, uh, it, it's a wide array of texts uh, written originally in Greek uh, between, generally speaking, between the 5th and the 4th century uh, BC. Um, but when we say Hippocrates, uh, we mean something pretty similar to what we mean when we say Homer, as a matter of fact. So Hippocrates uh, is probably not a real person, uh, or at least it's not a single person. All the, all the texts that are uh, attributed to Hippocrates uh, are actually most probably the result of uh, various minds, right? The, the products of various different minds. So various different doctors, various different writers 
um, uh, contributed to what we know as the Hippocratic corpus uh, across, you know, across the ages. Um, this, in particular, this one is a um, is an excerpt from the aphorisms. The the aphorisms is the uh, is the work of Hippocrates that uh, begins with the famous sentence: uh, "Life is short and art is long." Uh, Ars longa vita brevis, right? Which actually continues on to say, um, opportunity is fleeting, experiment is difficult, uh, judgment is perilous, and so on and so forth. Uh, so actually, uh, the the very first aphorism of of Hippocrates tells you how hard it is to become a doctor, right? It, it's no becoming a doctor, learning the art of medicine is is not an easy task. It's 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 not easy today as, as it was, uh, and it wasn't in the, uh, in the 5th century BC either. Um, okay, so these are, these are the, main, uh, uh, the main types of sources. Now, of course, besides Hippocrates, uh, the other uh, towering figure in, um, uh, in ancient medical writing is uh, Galen, right? Claudius uh, Galenus in Latin. Uh, he was actually a Greek-speaking uh, physician, a Greek-speaking doctor who lived uh, in Rome for the most part uh, of his life. He actually uh, became, he, he was so successful that he became the personal doctor, the court doctor of uh, the emperor Marcus Aurelius in the, in the second century CE. Uh, so this is another guy uh, that will uh, will be keeping in mind for the for the rest of the talk and uh, so just just note that when we talk about Galen we're actually talking about uh, a specific person that actually existed and wrote a lot of uh, medical works um, when we talk about Hippocrates we're probably talking about a variety of people right a variety of doctors who uh, didn't just uh, cure patients, didn't just treat patients, but they also wrote about treating patients. They wrote about uh, how to treat them and, and why they apply the treatment that they apply to them. Um, okay, so let's, let's dive straight into what some of the, uh, the Hippocratic thinking is uh, behind, uh, behind the, uh, the most widespread uh, medical practices of antiquity. Um, an interesting, uh, at least one, one bit of Hippocratic uh, doctrine that I find particularly interesting uh, is the idea that you have to know the person that has the disease even more than you, know, than you have to know what disease the person has. Uh, so the, uh, in a way, the, the human and the individualized aspect of, uh, of medicine is very strong in the, in the Hippocratic writings. Um, uh, Hippocrates, or you know, whoever, whoever we mean by that, um, always recommends finding out, inquiring a lot about the person that you're treating, what kind of patient, what kind of person uh, you have to deal with. Uh, so do they have any uh, pre-existing conditions, for example? Um, are, they, uh, are they a man or a woman? Uh, what gender are they? What age are they? And where are they from? Uh, where do they spend uh, most of their life? Um, because uh, ge geographical differences are also important. It, it, it matters a lot. Uh, according to Hippocrates, it, it matters a lot to know whether the person you're curing lives uh, in a very kind of hot and humid climate or in a very cold and dry climate, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so all these details need to be part of the, uh, of the medical inquiry, uh, even before you start um, trying to figure out what exactly the disease is that the person has, so you, before you start your diagnosis. And uh, once you're done with your diagnosis and you, figure, you figured out what disease they have, uh, then there's another uh, very important part of, the, uh, of, of medical theory, which is you have to do a prognosis, right? You have to uh, prognosticate, you have to try and 
um, make a forecast, as it were, of how the disease will progress, what will, what will happen to the patient, right? Um, how uh, is the patient likely to survive their disease? Are they more likely to not survive? Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so much so that a lot of people in antiquity started thinking at some point in the fifth century, a lot of people started thinking that uh, medicine was kind of similar to the art of divination, right? The art of sort of predicting the future through uh, tangible signs, right? Um, as a matter of fact, the doctors uh, didn't really like this analogy. They, they tried to uh, react to it and fight against it and say that actually, no, medicine is not a form of divination. Medicine is, is much more scientific than that. But it's still interesting that the, that the analogy was there, right? The, the very fact that they react against it uh, means that, they, uh, that there were probably a lot of people who, who thought in that way. Uh, about medicine. Now, um, you've probably heard uh, of, uh, you probably heard about the theory of the four humors. This is perhaps the, the best known or the most popular uh, bit of Hippocratic thought. Uh, it originally comes from this uh, very important key text in the corpus, which is uh, the, nature of the nature of man, uh, specifically the beginning of, of nature of man. Uh, so I'll, I'll go rather quickly here because this is this is mostly familiar stuff. Um, according to to Hippocrates and most of ancient uh, medical thought, um, the relationship between body and health or disease uh, is predicated upon the balance of uh, four fundamental substances. These four substances are the bodily fluids, as it were, the liquids, the fluids that, uh, that the body is ultimately made of, right? These are the, the ultimate elemental components of, of the human body. And they are uh, the blood, the phlegm, the black bile, and the yellow bile. Now, these four humors are subdivided according to, uh, they're distinguished from, from one another according to their qualities, according to certain principles that are kind of uh, opposed to each other, uh, specifically the hot and the cold, the wet and dry. So blood, for example, is hot and wet, phlegm is wet and cold, yellow bile is hot and dry, and, and so on and so forth. And what's, what's kind of cool about this is that uh, there's a way to map to map this onto the theory of the four elements, which was uh, the main principle in, in a different science, not medicine, but physics, right? Uh, so in a lot of, uh, not all of ancient physics, but a lot of ancient physics uh, was based on the idea that uh, the world around us is composed of four uh, fundamental elements, air, fire, earth, and water, which are also distinguished according to uh, the qualities of hot, cold, wet, and dry, okay? And so you can map the humors onto the elements in this way, as you see here in the picture, right? So the, the fundamental idea here from a medical point of view is that uh, the body is healthy when uh, these four humors are perfectly in balance with one another. They're perfectly balanced in equilibrium, okay? Uh, so there's not too much or too little of any of the four, okay? So by contrast, uh, when you catch a disease, this means when you're feeling sick, this means that there's either too much or too little of one of these four humors in, in your body. And so the, the job of the doctor, the doctor's job is to restore that balance and fight against the imbalance, right? So for example, if you have, uh, if you have too much phlegm in your body, which typically means you have some kind of respiratory disease, right? Such as, such as COVID-19, by the way, right? A Hippocratic doctor would say that, that COVID-19 is a, is a phlegmatic disease par excellence. Um, uh, phlegm is, is generally thought to be equivalent to what we call mucus, right? So if you have a phlegmatic disease, what you have to do is get rid of the excess of phlegm for, from your body. Uh, if you have too, um, uh, too much blood, you have to get rid of 
uh, that excess of blood and and blood was thought to cause uh, the excess of blood was thought to uh, cause a number of diseases including fevers and and other things um, so um, another interesting fact about this uh, humoral theory as it's known is that uh, you can also map the seasons of the year on this uh, on this picture here so you can say that phlegm is kind of prevalent in winter, right? So phlegmatic diseases uh, tend, to be, uh, tend to be more widespread in the winter. And this is, you know, this is perfectly in accordance with uh, common experience, right? You, you're more likely to catch a cold uh, or, uh, or the flu or whatnot uh, during the winter. Um, uh, by contrast, uh, yellow bile related diseases are more common in the summer because uh, summer is a uh, is a hot and dry season, at least according to this theory, and so on and so forth. Now, later on, uh, as, the, as the Hippocratic theory of the humors became uh, more and more kind of dominant uh, in, uh, in the medical world, uh, people started associating uh, mental qualities, psychological qualities as well, to each of the four humors. Uh, so there's this idea, and, and this, this tends to be, um, this, this tends to um, be more widespread uh, a lot later, actually. This is mostly uh, the case in the, in the medieval and, and Renaissance and early modern world, uh, where people start associating characters, psychological characters to the four humors. Uh, so if you tend to have a lot of phlegm in your body, you're a phlegmatic person, okay? Um, by contrast, if you have a lot of black bile uh, in your body, you, uh, you can be called a melancholic person, right? Melainachole in Greek is, is black bile, so that's where the word melancholia uh, comes from, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, um, sometime after Hippocrates, uh, specifically in the uh, first half of the third century uh, BC, um, medicine sort of moved beyond uh, this, uh, this purely, um, I can't really say that the, the humoral theory was, uh, uh, was laid by the side, absolutely not, but uh, there was a major breakthrough in medical research in the sense that uh, anatomy started uh, making a lot of progress, thanks in particular to these two guys, Herophilus and, and Erasistratus, known as uh, collectively as the butchers of Alexandria. Uh, I'm sure everybody can guess why uh, they're uh, called by that name. Uh, it's because they actually performed a lot of dissections uh, and, and a lot of vivisection of uh, human bodies, right? So uh, they started realizing that if, uh, if, you, if as a doctor you want to know more about the human body in order to cure it, uh, you have to cut it open, right? There's no other way. You have to cut people open and see what's inside. Now, of course, you can see that, uh, you know, vivisecting humans, uh, particularly uh, convicts, you know, criminals and, and so on, uh, this was the, the general practice in, in Alexandria in, in the third century. Uh, this was, of course, very controversial, and, and, and it still is. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of controversy among scholars uh, as to, you know, to what extent this was legal, for example, to what extent this was permitted uh, at the time, uh, to what extent this should be considered a kind of ethical uh, medical practice, and so on. Uh, so anyway, they, um, they kick-started a kind of uh, new wave of anatomical research, which was picked up and, and, um, uh, and elaborated upon by the, uh, the giant of ancient medicine that we've already mentioned, uh, Galen of Pergamum, who uh, lived in the second century CE, so a, a long time after uh, Herophilus and Erasistratus, but was very familiar with them. In fact, Galen is our main source for what uh, Herophilus and Erasistratus did, because we don't actually have any works by them. Uh, there's nothing really that, uh, that survives 
uh, of the two butchers, except fragments and testimonies. Um, the other guy who talks about them a lot is, is actually Celsus. Uh, so I'm, I'm rather happy that uh, we included Celsus into the, the curriculum for Living Latin Online. And I'm sure that many of you uh, have, been, have been reading Celsus uh, during this program. So besides Celsus, uh, Galen is the other main source uh, for um, Herophilus and Erasistratus' uh, work, uh, but he, he moves even beyond that and uh, he actually um, uh, gives anatomy a rather modern form uh, in terms of experimental research. He also carried out a lot of dissection, uh, primarily animal dissection and, and vivisection. Um, and uh, he, above all, he wrote everything he did. He wrote about everything he did and thought and every patient he cured and, and so on and so forth. Uh, he wrote so much that it's sometimes it's estimated that Galen alone, the works of Galen alone account for something like 10 or 12 percent of extant Greek literature, right? Uh, let's say 12% of Greek literature is Galen. It's, it's an enormous, it's a huge amount of writing that he did. Uh, sometimes people wonder how, uh, how exactly he had the time to uh, write all that stuff and also perform surgery and cure patients and whatnot. Um, he was, of course, aware, he was well aware of being uh, extremely successful, both as a doctor and as a, as a medical writer, uh, so that in, in his typical uh, modesty, or lack thereof, he compares himself to no less than the emperor Trajan. Uh, he says that, you know, just as Trajan restored ancient roads in Italy, that were previously kind of abandoned or muddy or rock strewn or full of thorns and so on. Uh, so did Galen um, build upon the medical findings of the past and uh, paved the way literally for, uh, for new discoveries, right? So this is a you know, very interesting passage that I put here uh, about the comparison between these two guys, uh, Galen and, and Trajan. The other main innovation that Galen, Galen is generally credited with uh, is the idea that uh, medicine can be, dis, is, can be established as a, as a logical science. Uh, so Galen is, was very interested in philosophy and specifically in logic. Uh, he, he knew Aristotle almost by heart. Uh, he quotes Aristotle and Plato uh, constantly uh, alongside Hippocrates. And uh, he, came to the, he came to be convinced that you can demonstrate medical proposition, uh, you know, medical uh, you know, ideas and propositions almost in the same way in which you can demonstrate mathematical theorems, right, logical theorems, and so on. So he, uh, he says here in, in, a, in a kind of autobiographical work, uh, he says that he was so interested in logic that uh, he wanted to hear about nothing else other than proof. And he, apply, he actually applies that logical method um, so often that he, that he actually makes uh, anatomical mistakes because of it, right? So for example, uh, this is you know, one of the most famous uh, mistakes of, of Galen. He asserts that the, um, the, the, uh, the vein system in the body, as opposed to the artery system, um, originates in the liver. Why does he do that? Well, Partly because the uh, one of the biggest the biggest vein in the body is the uh, inferior vena cava that you have here, which goes through the liver. So that that's that's part of why. But most importantly, as you can see here in the passage, because he really wants there to be some kind of logical symmetry between uh, the artery system and the vein system, so that you know just as the arteries originate in the heart. So, have, so do the veins have to originate somewhere, right? So the, vein, the origin of, of the veins must be somewhere else, somewhere other than the heart. And, and he comes to the conclusion that the liver is where they come from. So you can see how uh, anatomy with Galen we, becomes a lot more complex than it, than it previously was because Galen uh, painstakingly uh, describes and analyzes 
the circulatory system in, in the body, the, uh, the respiratory system, and most importantly, the nervous system. He's, he's generally credited with being the first uh, doctor in antiquity uh, who uh, gave a full account of the uh, functioning of the human brain and uh, the rest of the nervous system. Okay, um, so once we've, uh, now that we've gone over uh, some of the ideas, some of the theories uh, that we have from ancient uh, medical writers, we can take a look at the practices that they, um, that they worked with. Ultimately, you know, every doctor is a, is a craftsman uh, in antiquity, so they don't just write and, and theorize about medicine, but they most importantly practice it. Um, so, one idea that I, one thing that I find really fascinating about uh, ancient medical practice is that uh, at least Hippocratic doctors, but most doctors in antiquity, uh, really started with diet. Okay, so they uh, they really understood the importance of um, the food that you eat and the role that what you eat plays in uh, whether you're healthy or not, right? So food is, is, is really what uh, makes or breaks the health of your body ultimately. So every, every medical prescription in antiquity starts with uh, prescribing a certain regimen, a certain diet, a certain kind of food. And this is, uh, I, I was telling the students in, in my class earlier today, this is by no means a trivial idea. This is far from obvious. I mean, it may be obvious to you today, uh, but for a long time, especially in, in the early modern and, and, and modern age, um, for a very long time, uh, medicine and, and dietetics uh, were thought to be, you know, kind of separate disciplines, kind of separate sciences, uh, because the doctor, the idea was the doctor really only intervenes when you're sick, right? When you get sick, then uh, the doctor prescribes you something to cure you. Um, whereas the dietitian or the, the nutritionist can uh, uh, make their prescription even when you're not sick, right? When you're perfectly healthy. Now, um, Hippocrates would say that this distinction is nonsense, right? That medicine actually needs to care quite a lot about what people eat, you know, the kind of foods that, that, that people eat uh, to stay healthy. We've said that... Uh, health was generally construed as the, the balance of the four humors. And we've said that blood, uh, the excess of blood was generally thought to be at the root, the root cause of many uh, diseases in antiquity. Um, so one of the practices that ancient doctors um, were particularly fond of is bloodletting, right? So you, um, you basically cut open somebody's vein, right? Typically in the arm or in the, in the forehead. Uh, you, cut, you cut the patient's vein open to remove, to let the blood flow and remove it uh, from the body so that the excess of blood uh, can be removed and health restored. Now, this is of course, uh, this is of course an extremely dangerous practice, which uh, probably led to uh, a lot more deaths then it led to uh, recoveries. And uh, because of the authority of Hippocrates and Galen, uh, it was actually used for a very long time, uh, even after antiquity. Uh, I mean, just to give you one single example, George Washington himself is, uh, is, thought to, is, is typically thought to have died uh, because of the complications uh, resulting from bloodletting. So, uh, you know, George Washington's doctor had uh, performed bloodletting on him to, to cure, you know, a very mild um, respiratory disease and that, and that led to his actual death. Oh, sorry. Um, oh. We know, as you can probably guess from what we've been talking about, we know a lot more 
about uh, external medicine in antiquity. Uh, we know about surgery, the surgical tradition, the, the, the treatment of fractures and wounds, uh, a lot more than we know about uh, internal medicine. Uh, although there are uh, many important sources uh, about internal medicine in antiquity, and particularly uh, mm, the kinds of drugs that were administered uh, by ancient doctors, we know that they were uh, primarily plant-based, uh, right? You can see here in this illuminated manuscript, uh, you know, the picture is a mandrake, a plant that was typically thought to have curative powers because it kind of resembles, uh, at least they thought, uh, the root of the mandrake resembles a, a kind of human silhouette, right? So they, uh, they administered a lot of mandrake-based drugs. And there were, other, uh, there were many other plants that were, that were known to have curative powers, uh, dill, for example, anise, wormwood, uh, and so on. So depending on, depending on the virtue of the plant, the drugs were classified uh, according to what kind of humor they expelled from the body or what kind of humor they uh, fostered in the body. Uh, so some, some drugs were emetic uh, in the sense that they helped uh, the patient vomit, right? Some drugs were expectorants, so they helped the patient get rid of the phlegm and, and so on and so forth, primarily plant-based. Um, as we said, we, we know about uh, surgery and external medicine uh, from uh, from art as well. This is uh, this is uh, a fresco from from Pompeii uh, of Aeneas being treated by uh, Iapix. Bonus points if you remember where uh, Virgil talks about it. Uh, hint: it's uh, it's Book Twelve uh, of the Aeneid. Um, and, and a curious, interesting fact about ancient surgery is that. Gladiators were actually very often treated by the best doctors available. This is, you know, this is very kind of counterintuitive because we're used to, you know, watching Hollywood movies about gladiators and so on, where gladiators are generally depicted as having a very kind of low social status. And this is partly true because gladiators were typically slaves or war prisoners and so on, but they were very special slaves, right? They were particularly expensive. It was, you know, if you were a slave a slaveholder in antiquity and you wanted to have um, uh, gladiatorial games uh, in your name, uh, you actually had to spend quite a lot of money on acquiring the gladiators, having them fight. And so you didn't really want your gladiator to die in the arena right away. And so that's how uh, gladiators came to receive uh, the best possible health care. Uh, here uh, is an illustration of Galen treated, treating a gladiator. So this, this actually happened, right? We know that Galen, as he tells us, Galen treated gladiators in uh, his native town, uh, Pergamum. Um, so, you know, think about this, the, the future imperial doctor uh, who cured Marcus Aurelius spent actually a lot of time, uh, and, you know, one of the best doctors in antiquity, he spent a lot of time treating uh, gladiatorial wounds and injures um, and so on. Um, we can conclude on, uh, before concluding, I wanted to mention uh, another part of ancient medicine, which is particularly dear to me, uh, uh, namely midwifery, right? Midwifery plays an important role in uh, ancient medicine and intellectual history, because remember that Plato uh, always makes a comparison between the, the Socratic method and what a midwife does uh, what a midwife does. So uh, the midwife helps uh, a woman uh, give birth to a child, right? So helps deliver the baby, uh, whereas Socrates helps uh, people give birth to ideas, right? So Socrates is kind of a midwife. And this, uh, this woman uh, depicted here in the, in the illustration is Hagnodice, the person who was generally considered to be the first midwife in antiquity. And you see that um, uh, as, as depicted here, she actually had to uh, disguise herself as a man. The story goes, it's probably, you know, a, a, a kind of legend, but uh, nonetheless, uh, sh the story says she had to uh, disguise as a man in order to uh, practice midwifery, because at the time, 
um, women were generally not allowed to practice medicine. Uh, we're in classical Athens, the story goes, and she uh, takes the uh, uh, she takes the appearance of a man to uh, in order to practice uh, to learn and practice the art of midwifery, um, which of course became uh, very widespread after uh, in and after the the classical age, and we actually know that. Uh, there were a lot more, uh, th there actually were a lot more women who practiced medicine than the sources would like us to think for the most part. Okay, so we're running out of time, so, uh, so let me conclude. Um, medical knowledge from antiquity uh, was never really lost. So the, particularly the memory of, uh, you know, the achievements, the, the scientific discoveries and the progress of ancient medicine uh, kind of always remained in the uh, more or less consciously in the minds of uh, people in in Europe after antiquity. So here, for example, uh, you know, a medieval fresco in Anagni, Italy, shows Galen and Hippocrates, who obviously never met each other because they they lived many centuries apart from each other. But ideally, can, in a kind of idealized way, uh, Galen and Hippocrates are here, you know, talking to each other, uh, happily uh, discussing uh, medical theories and practices and so on with one another. Um, and think also think of uh, the uh, persistence of the figure of Asclepius, which we uh, talked about uh, at the beginning of the talk. So we kind of come back full circle. Uh, this is this here in the picture is a uh, is an 18th century uh, temple of Asclepius, so an early modern temple uh, built for an ancient statue of Asclepius in the Villa Borghese here in Rome, not far from. Uh, not far from where I am right now. Um, and it was probably, uh, at least this is what most people think, it was probably built as a kind of reminiscence of the ancient uh, temple of Asclepius in Rome, which doesn't really exist anymore. We only have uh, fragments of it here in the, the bottom left side of the, of the picture. Uh, so um, Asclepius was thought to have uh, disembarked on the Tiber Island in Rome and introduced medicine to the um, uh, to the Romans. So here is the um, uh, the, the the remains of the temple uh, of Asclepius on the Tiber Island and the the, the early modern version built as a kind of reminiscent uh, reminiscence of it. Uh, but most importantly, I think that the main uh, legacy, the most important legacy of ancient medicine today. Uh, is really the amount of ideas, the amount of thinking uh, that ancient doctors did and recorded in their writings about um, how to practice medicine, why to practice medicine, and uh, how best to ethically practice medicine, right? How to, um, how to sort of have a good relationship, a good and ethical relationship with the patient uh, and so on. So these, uh, these ideas and the questions that the physicians asked of themselves uh, and of the, the, of the science of medicine in antiquity, so the, the, the kind of epistemic questions uh, that they brought forth uh, are still, in many ways, are still the same questions that uh, doctors ask today. And so that's why uh, the quote that I put here is uh, actually from the modern version of the Hippocratic Oath. So the doctor swears, the aspiring doctor swears and says, I will respect the hard-won scientific gains of those physicians in whose steps I walk. And of course, ancient physicians are part of that. Uh, modern doctors still walk in the in the steps in the footsteps of Hippocrates and Galen and Herophilus and all the other uh, ancient doctors that made me contributed to to making medicine uh, what it is now. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh... Thank you very much, Marco. That was that was excellent. I, I'm, I'm. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's thunderous applause happening at the moment. You just can't hear it because it's uh, it's on. Uh, there, there's some from uh, <laughs> from Tyler. Um, 
uh, do we want to take a, a question or two? Uh, does anyone uh, have any questions? If you do, you can raise your hand. Uh, Uh, we have a hand from Audrey. Yes, go hi, ahead, Audrey. Thank you, Marco. Oh, hi. Hey, Audrey. Nice to see you. Um, long time no see. I was just going to ask how you propose we look at mistakes that have been made by physicians or doctors in the past. Like one example that I kept thinking of when you mentioned um, like the veins and how Galen thought they originated in the liver was when like in the beginning of cancer research when they thought when you had a tumor you would try to especially breast cancer you would try to cut the entire breast off or mistakes like that that have um, affected lots of people and probably did more harm than good because of the authority of some of the doctors involved um, how do you propose people especially doctors that practice medicine now um, sort of look at things that have happened in the past, things, examples like that? Well, that's a, that's a very tough question. Thank you, Audrey. Um, I'm sure that that question has, has been on, on many uh, people's minds uh, during the talk. I, I guess the answer that an ancient doctor would give you specifically, especially someone like Galen, the answer that they would give you is that rather than the results per se, uh, what really matters is the method by which you achieve them. So, so Galen uh, says again and time and again in his you know, humongous work, uh, he repeatedly says that uh, the doctor ought to be judged by the process, right? The, the success of the doctor needs to be judged by the, by the process more than uh, by the outcome, right? So the fact that uh, some uh, ideas and some practices in ancient medicine and even and especially even in modern medicine turned out to be not only wrong but even harmful to the patient uh, does not really uh, does not really affect uh, doesn't really damage uh, the um, the reputation of medicine itself as a science as long as those discoveries as long as those results were achieved by uh, respecting the method, right? By, by abiding by uh, the method of medicine, which, which Galen uh, talks about at length, right? So the, uh, uh, the idea is always that uh, new discoveries can uh, arise even when we think that we've figured everything out, right? Um, uh, for example, you know, we can still, we still have to find a vaccine, right, for COVID-19. It still hasn't, it hasn't conclusively uh, been found yet, right? So new discoveries can arise, uh, new vaccines can be made, new drugs can be created, okay? Uh, whether their drugs turn out to be uh, good or bad, if, if they turn out to be effective, if they turn out to be not effective or even harmful, uh, according to a lot of ancient doctors, is actually a secondary matter, is a matter of kind of secondary importance uh, compared to uh, how we are understand and whether we understand uh, the process by which those discoveries are achieved. Uh, it looks like Austin has a question. Yes, please. So. Uh, this is actually a more bioethical question and more bioethical than historiographical. So uh, at least the model of the Hippocratic Oath says that it is important for a physician to uh, observe the economic needs of the patient. But in our modern society, our medicine is becoming quite expensive and many patients struggle to pay. So is this a violation of the Hippocratic Oath? Wow, uh, that's, that's an even tougher question. I, I'm not sure that I uh, would be the, the right person to answer that because I'm not actually a doctor. Um, but well, very interestingly, uh, there is some, some recent research on how those dynamics, those kind of economic dynamics worked in, in antiquity, right? So for example, we know that 
uh, a lot of a lot of doctors uh, treated patients on a on a sort of pro bono basis if they didn't really have uh, if the patient didn't really have the economic means to uh, to pay for the treatment and the the ancient Hippocratic oath. Uh, makes the uh, the doctor swear that they will not deny treatment to anyone who is related to them or who is uh, related to their master, to their, or in other words, to their teacher, uh, to the person who taught them the art of medicine, and so on. So there is this kind of uh, you know th this kind of attempt at defining and defining an ethics of. Uh, when to uh, uh, when to treat someone even if they can't pay for the treatment. I think that you know my my I guess my favorite my own favorite answer to that question would be just you know think again about uh, think once more about Galen treating gladiators. Right, you have uh, you have the best available doctor, the single best doctor in the ancient world, who is giving the best surgical treatment to uh, a bunch of slaves. Now that's pretty amazing, right? Thanks for the question. Any other questions before we call it a talk? All right, I don't see any. Um, so thank you very much, Marco, and thanks uh, to everyone for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, I thought it was great. Uh, all right, we are going to um, put this talk up online, uh, probably on Paideia's YouTube channel, and then we'll send around an email with a link to that. So uh, if you want to watch it again or uh, just uh, replay the highlights, you can do that. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you, Marco. Everyone have a great weekend um, and I uh, hope you're enjoying the program. Walete omnes. Walete.